which will be covering which will be covering non-invasive biomarkers in transplant, both cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling. So today I have the honor of introducing um, our two speakers, Dr. Eric Henriksen and Dr. Dana Pierce. Dr. Henriksen is a solid organ transplant pharmacist and is the director of the Heart Transplant Research Database at Stanford in Palo Alto, California. He earned his PharmD from the University of Cincinnati. His PGY-1 residency was completed at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, and his PGY-2 in solid organ transplant was completed at the University of California, San Francisco. He currently serves as the chair of the ACCP Transplant Workforce Committee, ACCP 2023 Annual Meeting Planning Committee, ISHLT 2024 Annual Meeting Planning Committee, and is the co-director of Stanford's Pharmacy Resident Research Seminar. In 2023, he was awarded ISHLT's Pharmacy Professional Community Award for Excellence and the Preceptor of the Year for Stanford University. His main passion in practice is reducing the burden of transplant care on both patients and their caregivers. We also have Dr. Dana Pierce. Dr. Pierce is a clinical abdominal transplant pharmacist at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She completed her pharmacy school, PGY-1 pharmacy practice residency, and PGY-2 solid organ transplant residency at UIC College of Pharmacy. She's passionate about clinical transplant research and precepting learners, and she's excited to be discussing non-invasive biomarkers with you all today. And then before we start, again, here is um, our, our um, accreditation statement for CE, which we'll cover again at the end. And with that, we will go ahead and give side control to Dr. Henriksen, and he can take it away. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to ACCP for allowing me to present today. I'm excited to discuss, oh, sorry, I think I requested. Okay. I'm excited to discuss non-invasive biomarkers and transplant. Uh, cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling, specifically in heart transplant. Um, disclosures, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, but I will be discussing uh, the following tests, which haven't been approved by the FDA, uh, but they have met CLSI standards, both Allosure Heart and Prospera Heart. The objectives of today's lecture is we're going to review literature for use for donor-derived cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling in cardiothoracic transplant. We're going to identify patients that may be appropriate for rejection surveillance using donor-derived cell-free DNA and or gene expression profiling. So what are the advantages of molecular testing? For years, the gold standard for diagnosis of rejection has been endomyocardial biopsy. However, recently that paradigm has begun to shift in, with the introduction of uh, molecular testing. The endomyocardial biopsy, as we all are aware, is limited by its invasive nature, uh, increased cost for patients, and specifically the institution when you think about staffing a cath lab, all the, the, move, all the parts that were, are required for this. It's also limited uh, by the scope of the myocardium, so where you actually obtain that biopsy from. It may not be showing rejection there, but your graft may be experiencing uh, rejection elsewhere. It's subjective, uh, especially in, depending on who's looking at your uh, slides, they may interpret them differently. And for patients specifically, it can be quite an anxiety provoking because it's another procedure they have to do. Whereas our transplant patients are quite used to getting blood tests for things like their tricholinus levels, um, so much easier on them. And then for us specifically, and maybe other centers, the cath lab availability is harder to get than some uh, Michelin star restaurants in terms of uh, the availability is quite low um, on a day-to-day -day and we can often delay discharges or um, delay diagnoses if there isn't availability of staff. But what this slide shows is when we talk about rejection, the proposed uh, the processes, you start with a molecular presentation and this is early and highly sensitive markers start to go up. And then you have a subclinical presentation, and this is often shown with DSAs or biopsies. And you think of patients who have a biopsy positive but may not have uh, graft dysfunction. And then the classic case of rejection um, for not surveillance is they show up with 
um, graph decline, and then we get a biopsy and that kind of confirms our diagnosis. So the first test I'm gonna discuss is gene expression profiling. And the hypothesis behind gene expression profiling is gene expression signatures of immune activation and leukocyte trafficking are often detectable in uh, patients and reflect rejection status of the allograft. A gene expression test could be developed to discriminate between the absence of rejection, which would be grade zero, from moderate to severe rejection, and they did grade 3A or 2R. The main pilot study for this is called the CARGO study, which is abbreviated for the Cardiac Allograft Rejection Gene Expression Profiling Observational Study. It includes 629 patients at eight different centers. There's 4,917 paired blood tests and biopsy samples. 827 biopsies graded by three central pathologists, and it had three phases, gene discovery, training, and diagnosis, diagnostic development, and validation. And when, you, when, the, uh, when the results were correlated, they found that there was 11 different genes that could be used as a classifier uh, for acute rejection, and those are listed here. The classifier score was rated from 1 to 40, and that's how we came up with our GEP uh, result when we look at the, uh, when the lab results. So now applying those, uh, this, the CARGO study to actual clinical outcomes was the IMAGE trial, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So anytime a transplant study gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know it's kind of a big deal. But the purpose of the study was to test whether non-invasive rejection surveillance strategies um, utilizing gene expression profiling is not inferior to traditional utilizing in the traditional method using biopsies. And during the study period, they estimated upon the UNOS data that nearly 3,000 patients were transplanted. Um, at one of the image study centers and eligible for participation within the study. So again, multiple centers, so up to 3,000 patients were eligible uh, between those centers. Of those, 602 non-consecutive patients were randomized into the study and assigned equally between the gene expression profiling and the biopsy-based monitoring. At pre-specified intervals ranging from 1 to 12 months, depending upon the image center and the patient's time post-transplant, study participants underwent uh, clinical assessment along with echoes and rejection monitoring using either GEP or routine biopsy approach. A threshold of 34 was used at nine, in 97% of the GEP scores after early protocol amendment to the study in order to identify patients at low risk of rejection who did not need a biopsy. Patients were followed for a mean of 19 months, and then the primary outcome was a composite rejection with hemodynamic compromise, graft dysfunction due to other causes, death, or retransplantation. In this first figure, you can see that there's no div uh, difference in development of rejection with hemodynamic compromise, uh, deaths or retransplant. And then moving on, you can also see that the survival rates between both cohorts were similar or, and excellent. Finally, you can see that the number of biopsies per year were significantly fewer uh, in the gene expression profiling. The majority of patients within the gene expression profiling cohort had one or less biopsy per patient year. And if your patients are anything like mine, the, you, can, you know that they expect the first two figures in terms of outcomes. But the thing that makes them the most happy is the fact that they don't have to go undergo more biopsies. And so if you can avoid this procedure and then also free up your cath lab, that's a huge advantage to your program and patients. So what are the limitations of gene expression profiling? One is it has a low positive predictive value. Um, and so it was mainly look at low risk patient populations, low prevalence of ACR. It's not validated for antibody-mediated rejection. And it's affected by other things that may influence your immune response. So if, uh, patients who had CMV viremia, if you're on high dose steroids, it affects the, the test. So it's not recommended if you're on 20 milligrams a day or greater. And then the recent blood transfusions, as well as giving patient growth factor. Moving on to donor-derived cell-free DNA. So the, um, the presence of extracellular nucleic acid in the blood test was first described by Mandel in 1948. In 1966, DNA was identified in plasma patients with lupus, 
um, and they thought it was due to tissue breakdown. Cancer patients were then shown to have higher serum DNA levels than healthy controls, again, kind of furthering this hypothesis. And 20 years later, uh, there was growing widespread interest in cell-free DNA research with the discovery of free fetal DNA in maternal blood. In 2020, a Stanford bioengineer, uh, Dr. Quake, uh, was able to perform a clinical application of cell-free DNA analysis for detection of fetal chromosome abnormalities. And then where this leads us now is actually Dr. Valentine, one of our cardiologists at Stanford, attended a lecture discussing this new application. This led to a meeting over coffee to discuss the application of cell-free DNA in which she perceived as a, po a potential population of heart transplant recipients. I wish I could say my coffee breaks have led to such uh, meaningful impact, but I guess I haven't had enough coffees yet. But the principle of this donor drive cell-free DNA is that rejection causes damage to the affected organ. There's a certain level of donor-derived cell-free DNA circulating in all organ transplant recipients is when the levels begin to shift up that there's a sign of organ damage, which is most cases is, is likely from rejection. So the, again, proof of concept study is this uh, NIH grant study. It was the first prospective study of 161 heart transplant recipients. They collected serial blood samples, purified and sequences, sequenced cell-free DNA and plasma and compared them against biopsy grades. In figure A, you can see the fraction of donor-derived cell-free DNA of, over time from transplant from nine rejection-free uh, recipients. The solid line is a fit to the exponential decay. In figures B through D, you can see three different cases of rejection. The red solid lines, again, are present. So in figure B was an adult recipient with ACR episode about month 15. And here you can begin to see that the levels begin to spike much earlier. Figure C has an adult recipient who has suffered from ACR at month nine and subsequently required a new transplant at month 10. And so you can again see those curves begin to change. And then the final one is a pediatric heart transplant recipient who suffers from consecutive ACRs at month four and 12. And you can see, again, the levels beginning to go back down, but rise again once uh, the patient was experiencing their second rejection episode. Figure D is also important because of the use of donor-derived cell-free DNA also corresponds with antibody-mediated rejection, which was not necessarily the case for the gene expression profiling. So when we look at the ability to detect rejection, um, the, the, this figure shows that there's a statistically just significant increase in donor-derived cell-free DNA at the time of rejection. Additionally, and more arguably interesting, are the elevated levels as early as five months prior to biopsy-proven rejection. And again, these figures uh, kind of go along with I, what I mentioned early on in the slide, that we have these levels that begin to show early in the first stage, and then it goes on to show later on our, the subclinical presentation of biopsies or DSAs. So if we can intervene earlier, then we have the potential to save more graft function. The findings of the, the data for donor-derived cell-free DNA have been validated in a couple other studies and reproduced, one, one by Dr. Cush and colleagues in JHLT in 2017, as well as another consortium called the GRAFT cohort, which was published by Sean Agborino, Shaw, and Dr. Valentine in circulation in 2021. I didn't include them here for the sake of time. So again, taking that science and applying it clinically, we use the DOR or the donor-derived cell-free DNA outcomes, ALOMAP registry. It's a registry of 26 different transplant centers across the US. The purpose of this registry was to determine the test performance of donor-derived cell-free DNA for the detection of ACR, AMR, as well as graft dysfunction. In the first figure here, you can see that the elevated donor-derived cell-free DNA is associated with both ACR and or antibody-mediated rejection. And the median level for those was 0.17. Moving on to clinically significant uh, ACR defined as 2R or greater by ISHLT standards, again, donor-derived cell-free DNA levels are correlated with this outcome. However, the data weren't able to detect correlation between elevated donor-derived cell-free DNAs and AMR. However, when combining uh, AMR1 and 2, um, 
So again, maybe we can't pull from this data for, for that diagnosis. So additional findings from the Dior registry, the authors were able to show that elevated donor derived cell-free DNA was associated with graft dysfunction. They defined graft dysfunction as LVEF of less than 35%, use of inotropic support or hospitalization from graft dysfunction. When looking at the test performance, you can see that it's 44% sensitivity to detect rejection, which is not great. However, it did have a 97% predictive value. Given a negative test has a strong correlation with negative biopsy, it's the opportunity to save patients from many surveillance biopsies. The next study is uh, from a separate assay of donor-derived cell-free DNA. It's called the DeZeus study. Um, and this one does not require genotyping of either the donor or the recipient. The DeZeu study comes from 811 samples from 223 patients at the University of Utah, as well as the University of California, San Diego. Here you can see levels remain consistent until greater than 24 months post-transplant, where, uh, where levels are significantly higher later on. The authors found that patients at, uh, with cardiac allograft vasculopathy were more likely to have elevated levels at 24 months. And that may be why you see these results. The authors also suggest that this may be secondary to increased white blood cell fragility, secondary to prolonged sacrolimus uh, exposure. Here you can see that this assay has similar findings in the ability to detect rejection as a prior donor-derived cell-free DNA test. In addition to having significant, statistically significant difference between rejection episodes and elevated uh, levels, the authors have also found that clinical outcomes were similar. When the ROC analysis results of uh, discrimination of acute rejection from non-acute rejection by donor derived cell-free DNA testing was based off of bootstrapping performance estimates, and they're shown in the figures to the left. The AUC ROC was 0.86. On the right, you can see that the negative predictive value is similar to previously reported data for other donor derived cell-free DNA studies. So when we talk about combining the tests, is two tests better than one? And how do I choose which one to use for my patient? And so this actually comes from a, a wonderful review article in case you wanted someone who can speak a little bit more eloquently on this. Uh, this is from uh, Jack, heart failure. And here you can see based on the Dior studies, uh, how you interpret the results. So if someone has a normal um, donor derived cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling, then their likely of rejection is quite low. If they have high gene expression profiling, but they don't derive cell-free DNA, um, you may need to consider this from other sources. So do they have CMV? Um, are they on high doses of steroids recently? Uh, do they get a blood transfusion? If you have high donor derived cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling, uh, the consideration should be for all types of uh, graft injury, including AMR, CAV, or trauma. If both are high, it's strong likelihood of rejection, and you'll confirm with a biopsy. And also at the bottom, they have their definition um, for each value for you to reference to. So now applying the combination of these in the minimal biopsy protocol, and this is data that we published from Stanford, and looks at the first year survival from acute rejection, as well as freedom from DSAs. And here at Stanford, what we do is for our, just our heart alone transplant, so we'll get two biopsies, typically at week two and week three after transplant. And then unless for cause, we will just use non-invasive monitoring um, from then on. And so here you can see that our first year survival is similar between outcomes. And this study was retrospective of 64 patients within the combined donor-derived cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling versus 95 patients that use gene expression profiling and biopsy. Sorry, I'm having a little bit issues advancing sometimes. Um, so when we actually apply the same outcomes, but is it better for our patients? And here, again, you can see that patients in the non-invasive monitoring had significantly fewer biopsies compared to their gene expression profiling and biopsy cohort. And in fact, if we start to apply this to our more recent cohort, the number of biopsy also decreases. Some of these donor-derived cell-free gene expression profiling combos had higher numbers of biopsies because we weren't able to do these tests as an inpatient. Um, 
But now that we have that access, we have actually gone down in our total number of biopsies. When we look at uh, ES measurements at three, six, and 12 months post-transplant, they were also similar between the cohorts. So what about the long haul? So everyone's always focused on one-year outcomes and transplant in the U.S., unfortunately. But is this better for our patients going forward for a long period of time? And this is data I, I presented at ISHLT last year. And here you can see that our survival by cohort actually are donor cell-free DNA and gene expression, they were similar, even up to three years. And then the rate of rejection was lower in the gene expression profiling group compared to or, or the rejection-free survival is lower in the biopsy cohort compared to the donor-derived cell-free DNA. Again, when we look at our other clinical outcomes, they were similar between for EF in, the, in those early stages after transplant. And this is something we're working on publishing um, now. So I guess pulling things all together, when and where to use these tests. So I'm not going to read this fully for you, but this is a good reference. And it kind of reviews of when uh, absolute reasons that you shouldn't use some of these. So um, the gene expression profiling, again, is highly impacted by um, anything that basically uh, increases your, your immune response. So a lot of infections, specifically viral infections, as well as uh, any inflammatory inflamed state, as well as some other cutoffs. And then uh, for the donor-derived cell-free DNA, I think the big thing is uh, any source of myocardial trauma recently, specifically a biopsy. So if you had to choose the path, you should always start with the donor-derived cell-free DNA and then the biopsy after, unless you're willing to wait a few days after this. So when can I test? The gene expression profiling has been approved at 55 days post-transplant, assuming that that prednisone dose is less than, than stated here. And then the donor-derived cell-free DNA stability was just demonstrated around 14 days in the DOR and graft studies. But some centers are beginning to use as early as three to four weeks. Um, I am, I'm not sure it's advisable to go much earlier before that, than probably three weeks based off the data that we have. So what did I cover today? Um, so this has begun to spread to the lungs as well. But I didn't have enough time to go into that data as well as there's now some applications being used for non-invasive monitoring and other disease states for solid organ transplants, including uh, detection of infections. And then uh, there's a new tool um, called the molecular microscope, which again, I didn't have enough time to cover in my lecture today. So in summary, the use of non-invasive monitoring for rejection surveillance has strong negative predictive value. It has similar clinical outcomes and can be obtained with non-invasive surveillance compared to protocol using endomyocardial biopsies. Both donor-derived cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling tests have instances for which they should be used with caution. Providers should familiarize those cells with those scenarios. And for my acknowledgments, I'd like to thank Dr. Karen Cush, Dr. Jeff Tuberg, uh, Dr. Yasmo Yeti. Dr. Karen Cush and Dr. Jeff, Jeff Tuberg are outstanding speakers um, on this topic. And if you ever have the opportunity, um, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Yasmo Yeti uh, and Dr. And then Helen Lukert, who's one of our um, nurses. I'm sorry, she's not at the University of Toronto. She's at Stanford. Um, they've been integral in our Stanford Heart Transplant Database. And of course, I'd like to thank my colleagues that I work with, Roy Lee, Rita Mai, Tu Lee, and Eureka Wang, uh, who are outstanding pharmacists um, that I work, get to work with every day at Stanford. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions in the future. All right. Happy Saturday, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming and joining us today. My name is Dana Pierce, and I'm going to be uh, taking over for the abdominal side. Um, and I'd like to thank the programming committee for inviting me to speak today. Uh, in honor in, of uh, NSYNC getting back together, I'm going to be talking about bye-bye biopsies, um, cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling. Uh, credit for that title goes to Dr. Henriksen. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, here are my objectives that we're going to be talking about today. And there are already various different non-invasive markers that we currently use to help predict kidney allograft rejection, such as serum creatinine, cystatin C, urine output, DSA. However, we know that a major issue with these methods is the lack of specificity. 
since an elevated creatinine can be indicative of a variety of other issues uh, like infection, dehydration, obstructions, et cetera. So for that reason, the gold standard for diagnosis of rejection is a renal biopsy. However, biopsies are an invasive procedure and may cause various complications. Uh, patients are at risk of developing bleeds, either uremic bleeds or potentially from being on antiplatelet or anticoagulation agents. There's also a risk of developing infections, damaging the surrounding tissue, pain, discomfort, fistula development. And because of these various complications, the importance of biopsies or routine protocol biopsies starts to come into question. Um, so just a kind of an overview of cell-free DNA, it's uh, when fragmented DNA is released from a damaged cell and enters into the plasma. It can be found in the plasma of healthy adults, but at very low levels. And the concept of cell-free DNA was first utilized in other areas aside from transplant, initially in pregnancy. It was first discovered in 1948. Uh, Cell-free fetal DNA screening can be used in women who are at least 10 weeks pregnant to assess for chromosomal disorders and to assess the fetal sex. Uh, Cell-free DNA can also be used to assess for tumor-specific DNA, such as promoter regions of tumor suppressor genes. Um, like I said, DNA is released into the plasma under stress. So when patients undergo trauma, infection, sepsis, uh, have an MI, the levels are going to increase. And it's also been demonstrated as a marker for worsening complications in ICU patients. Um, but we're here to talk about transplant today. So we're going to be talking about its utilization in um, allograft rejection. So after an organ transplant, cell-free DNA from the donor sheds into the recipient bloodstream, testing methods with target amplification and sequencing of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs uh, to quantify the donor and recipient DNA. And these sequence variations or substitutions of a single nucleotide allow for the determination of donor versus recipient DNA and may correlate with allograft dysfunction. And the cell-free DNA is rapidly cleared with a half-life of only about 30 minutes. There's three different cell-free DNA tests commercially available in the U.S. There's AlloShare, Prospera, and TRAC. So first, we're going to be talking about AlloShare. It was validated in the DART study published in 2017, which was a prospective observational study throughout 14 different study sites. And all patients were enrolled at least one month post-transplant. The primary outcome was biopsy-proven rejection based on the BAMF 2013 criteria. Donor-derived cell-free DNA was measured at months 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, and 12, or at the time of clinically indicated biopsies. There were 219 patients that had at least one renal biopsy, 242 biopsies had sufficient specific, uh, specimens and uh, were reported the results. 84% of the biopsies were performed for clinical suspicion of rejection, so the vast majority. 14% uh, were for surveillance and 1.7% were for follow-up of treated rejections and only 3% of surveillance biopsies revealed rejection, so a very low rate of rejection uh, than in general. The patients included in the study were typically Caucasian or African-American, predominantly male patients. Patients were significantly younger age in the active rejection group, which is kind of what we would expect. The average time post-transplant of patients enrolled was about two to three years post-transplant. And there were significantly more deceased donors in the active rejection group. The average weight was about 85 kilos and average GFR was about 34. So this slide demonstrates the positive predictive value and negative predictive value. The graph on the left represents the PPV and NPV for acute rejection. And when utilizing a cutoff of 1%, the negative predictive value is 84% and the positive predictive value is 60.6%. The graph on the right represents the uh, positive and negative predictive values for antibody-mediated rejection specifically. And when utilizing a cutoff of 1% for AMR, there's a better NPV of 96.4%, but a worse um, positive predictive value of 44.4%. So it's better at ruling out AMR, um, but a little bit worse at ruling in AMR. The authors demonstrated that the donor-derived cell-free DNA discriminates active reje rejection. Um, the figure on the left demonstrates 
that the median donor derived cell free DNA in the active rejection group was 1.6% versus 0.3% for no rejection, which was statistically significant. And then the figure on the right demonstrates the serum creatinine in uh, active rejection versus no active rejection. And they uh, found that the serum creatinine was not significantly different in uh, medium values between the two groups. So therefore, the donor-derived cell-free DNA was found to discriminate active rejection, um, while the serum creatinine did not, suggesting that it might be a little bit more specific of a marker than serum creatinine alone. These figures represent the cell-free DNA broken down by rejection type. The figure on the left has donor-derived cell-free DNA on the y-axis and then the rejection type on the x-axis. And as you can see, the donor-derived cell-free DNA is higher in AMR compared to T-cell mediated rejection. So the median level was 2.9% for AMR and then 1.2% for cellular types at least 1B or higher and 0.2% for cellular type 1A. The graph on the right um, demonstrates that the donor-derived cell-free DNA is typically not elevated in low-grade uh, 1A cellular rejection, but increases as cellular rejection increases to 1B or higher. So this kind of reiterates that it's likely a better marker for AMR as compared to for ACR. Uh, there are some notable limitations to the study. The performance of donor-derived cell-free DNA may not assess for subclinical rejection as there were um, 34 surveillance biopsies versus 204 clinically indicated biopsies and only one of the surveillance biopsies demonstrated an active rejection. There were also issues with the collection of blood samples being mistimed or having an inadequate amount of DNA leading to biopsies without a matched uh, sample with 23% of the data missing or the samples missing. Additionally, the utilization of cell-free DNA may be confounded by alternative forms of allograft injury like BK, which wasn't assessed throughout the study. Um, the authors also didn't address or assess the optimal interval between samples. So that's still kind of left as a question in terms of how often to be checking these markers. There was also a lack of data in obese patients, so this can limit the applicability of the test in that patient population. In addition to the DART study, there have been follow-up studies for allergy performed. Um, so the ADMIRAL study was the largest multicenter prospective observational study, which included 1,092 patients. They found that an allosure cutoff of greater than 0.5% was associated with nearly three times higher risk of de novo DSA development, and that a persistently elevated allosure predicted a 25% decline in EGFR over three years. Um, there were follow-up studies performed using cohorts from the DART study as well, one of which demonstrated that retransplanted patients had higher donor-derived cell-free DNA, but were still below the 1% cutoff at the time of no rejection. Another study using a cohort from the DART study found that the median donor-derived cell-free DNA value was higher in patients with DSA and AMR as compared to those with DSA without AMR. And the positive predictive value was 81% in patients with AMR. So it may be a useful marker to use in conjugation with DSA. And then a third subtle analysis from the DART study looked at BK patients and found that the median cell-free DNA was 0.58% in those with BK viremia versus 3.38% in those with BK nephropathy, which is kind of suggesting that it may be useful for distinguishing between just BK viremia um, and BK nephropathy. And then the last study I wanted to highlight for AlloShare is by Stites and colleagues and was a multicenter prospective study of patients with 1A and borderline rejection. And they found that those with an elevated donor-derived cell-free DNA value had worse EGFR, more de novo DSA, and more future or persistent rejection. So it seems that even those with mild ACR may have worsening rejection episodes and outcomes in the future in the setting of an elevated allosure value. Okay, and then the next form of donor-derived cell-free DNA testing that I'm gonna be talking about is a Prospera. So Sigdal and colleagues performed a retrospective study of adult and young adult renal transplant recipients at UCSF. 
and all biopsies were graded by UCSF pathologists using the 2017 BAMF classification. A total of 300 plasma samples were collected from 193 renal transplant recipients. Of these 23 samples from 15 patients were excluded. This included samples collected within three days from transplant, samples unable to be sequenced. Um, and of the 277 samples, 217 were biopsy matched, including 38 collected from patients with biopsy proven active rejection, 72 with biopsy proven borderline rejection, 82 stable allografts, and 25 with a biopsy that indicated other injuries such as drug toxicity or viral infections. Of the 178 patients included in the study, 20% were under 18 years of age and half the patients were older than 40 years of age at the time of first blood sample. There were significantly more patients in the 40 to 80 age group range with active rejection. The patient population was relatively diverse between Hispanic, Caucasian, and African-American patients. The average weight of the patients was between 70 and 80 kilos. And there were also statistically more deceased donor transplants in the active rejection group of 92.1%. So the figure on the left represents the donor-derived cell-free DNA on the y-axis and then the rejection status on the x-axis. And the donor-derived cell-free DNA was significantly higher in the circulating plasma of the active rejection group compared with the non-rejection group with a medium of 2.32% versus 0.47% respectively, which was statistically significantly different. And then the figure on the right represents EGFR on the y-axis. Um, and EGFR is significantly better in patients with stable renal function, but demonstrates no difference between active rejection, borderline, or other injury. Therefore, um, this kind of demonstrates that the donor-derived cell-free DNA can discriminate between active rejection compared to a borderline injury or other injury or stable allograft function while the EGFR only um, discriminates between stable renal function and any form of renal injury. And then this slide contains the graphs demonstrating the sensitivity and specificity of the donor-derived cell-free DNA levels in the EGFR. And they found that the donor-derived cell-free DNA um, demonstrated greater sensitivity and specificity as compared to EGFR alone. A few limitations of the study are that it was retrospective, single center, allowing for bias. It included adult and pediatric recipients, which may have varying results if separated out. And while it's good that the study included other forms of allograft injury, it was only able to assess for those seen um, upon biopsy screening. They also didn't address or assess the optimal interval between samples. And there was also a lack of data in the obese patients. So this can also kind of limit its applicability in that patient population. And this slide's a stuttery, stu uh, summary of other data on Prospera. While the first study didn't show any difference in donor-derived cell-free DNA between AMR, cellular, and mixed rejection episodes, the trifecta study found that there were significantly lower levels in cellular rejection compared to AMR, which is similar to what was seen for AlloSure, um, kind of being more specific for AMR. And then the trifecta study also found to have slightly lower sensitivity and higher specificity than the original study did. There was also a single center retrospective study that included 41 patients where the authors utilized a combination of donor-derived cell-free DNA quantity and the donor-derived cell-free DNA percentage and found that the combination had an even better sensitivity of 100% and better specificity of 87.5%. So this kind of tells us that maybe in the future, it might be better to be looking at both the raw number and the percentage of donor-derived cell-free DNA as opposed to just the percentage alone. There was a comparison done um, in 2020 that was a prospective single center study of 76 patients comparing Allosher versus Prospera, but they didn't find any significant uh, difference in utilizing one over the other. And then the third um, testing method is TRAC. There aren't any published validation studies in abdominal transplant recipients, um, but they do have a separate cutoff than the other two of greater than 0.969% value being indicative of rejection and has a positive predictive value of 55% and negative predictive value of 86%. 
And then this chart just kind of compares the three different testing methods. Um, they all use the same technology of next generation sequencing. Alisher and Prospera have a turnaround time of about five days, with Track having a turnaround time of about um, or three days, and then Track having about five day turnaround time. And then Alisher and Prospera have a rejection threshold of greater than one percent as the cutoff, um, compared to the Track has the different cutoff, and they all have a relatively strong negative predictive value and a weak or moderate positive predictive value. And then I also have the SNPs listed here, but while theoretically more SNPs may be more specific to test for rejection, the different tests demonstrated similar predictive values. Um, so it's not too uh, different amongst the different testing. And all the testing methods are covered by Medicare insurance, but there was a recent billing article that arose a few months ago. So prior to this, Medicare was covering all testing methods at any time point without regulation. But now there are some limitations to what they will cover. So only one test is covered by insurance per encounter. So that's kind of why Omnigraph is no longer available and was pulled from the market since it is a combination of the cell-free DNA and gene expression profiling. And if it's used for surveillance, it must be used in lieu of a protocol biopsy. Otherwise, it must be documented what the cause is. And for cause can be a variety of different reasons, like being highly sensitized, having an alteration of immunosuppression, having a recent rejection treatment. So most patients that you'll want to utilize this in end up falling under one of these categories anyway. Um, and then Medicare also won't cover for testing if it's within one week after a biopsy. So that's something to be aware of as well. So if you want to do it in conjunction with a biopsy, it should be performed prior to the biopsy. There are several limitations to utilizing donor-derived cell free DNA testing. Um, they should not be performed within 24 hours of a biopsy or dialysis, as this could affect the result. Um, there's also a lack of data assessing rejection versus other forms of allograft injury. Um, there were some looking at BK, but they're very small studies. And then they are also susceptible to false positive and false negative results. Um, these are some potential causes of false, false positive or negative testing, um, kind of going back to where else this is utilized. Um, so obese patients, pregnant patients, septic, have cancer, an MI, or recent trauma can potentially have falsely uh, elevated or lower levels. And while donor-derived cell-free DNA is useful in patients with unstable allograft function, they don't typically aid in detection of subclinical acute rejection, which is where gene expression profiling comes in. It measures the mRNA expression profile in transplant recipients. And when the uh, mononuclear cells lysed um, and mRNA is isolated, allowing for real-time PCR quanti uh, quantify gene expression. And the two different tests are TrueGraph and Allomap. Um, Allomap kidney is still in the works, um, so it's only currently validated, validated in heart transplant. So I'm just going to be focusing on TrueGraph, which was validated in a study by Friedwald and colleagues in 2019. This was a 24-month observational study of 307 adult renal transplant recipients at Northwestern. And patients were excluded if they had an end block um, allograft or if the patients had HIV or hepatitis C. Surveillance biopsies were obtained at two to six months, 12 months, and 24 months post transplant. And the clinical phenotypes were subdivided as um, sub AR or TX. Patients had sub AR if, histolo um, if histology on a surveillance bi biopsy was consistent with acute rejection, and there was stable allograft function defined as a serum creatinine of less than 2.3 and a less than 20% increase in creatinine compared with prior values. And those patients who did not meet the sub-AR criteria were classified as TX or transplant excellence. Of the 307 subjects, um, 283 um, had sufficient data with at least one centrally read biopsy. And of those, 243 had sufficient um, data to define the clinical phenotype of either sub-AR or TX at 12 months, and 35 of which were sub-AR, 162 were TX, and 46 were mixed. 
The demographics are listed here. The mean donor age was about 40 years old, mean recipient age about 50 years old. Patients were predominantly Caucasian with about a fifth um, of patients being African-American. And for the results, this figure represents the clinical phenotype. The x-axis represents outcomes of the composite clinical outcome, which is defined as 24-month biopsy showing evidence of IFTA or BPAR on any four-cause biopsy, or a decrease in GFR by greater than 10 between four and 24 months post-transplant. And of the 253 subjects with stable renal function who underwent at least one surveillance biopsy, 13% demonstrated only sub-AR and, uh, or not, not TX. 57.7% demonstrated only TX and 29.2% demonstrated individual instances of either TX or sub-AR. The composite clinical outcome of BPAR were significantly different between the TX and sub-AR uh, phenotypes. The authors also assessed de novo DSA. The top graph represents results after one year and the bottom represents results after two years. And as you can see, the patients with TX phenotypes demonstrated significantly less de novo DSA at one and two years compared to those with the sub-AR phenotype. Some notable limitations of the study include the observational nature. Additionally, the positive threshold was arbitrarily selected, which may affect the predictive performance. However, the threshold did demonstrate significant difference at the cutoff. The study also excluded n block donors and HIV and hep C recipients, so this can limit the use in those specific patients. Also, they um, did not assess alternative causes of allograft injury aside from rejection like BK nephropathy, but since the patients uh, have stable allograft function, I wouldn't expect this to be a large confounder confounder um, compared to the prior studies in cell-free DNA. So here's just kind of a summary of what, um, of what the different tests are and kind of like when to utilize them just for your reference. Um, and then what do the guidelines say? So the BAMF uh, Minimally Invasive Diagnostics Working Group does have recommendations on these testing methods. Um, they state that um, it should not be used as a standalone diagnostic test, but could be potentially used in the future to differentiate between AMR and cellular rejection, and potentially as an adjunct to histology, similar to how we utilize DSA um, at current practice. And then this is just an example protocol um, of what we created here at UIC. We utilize gene expression profiling for patients with stable allograft function, while, um, while those with unstable allograft function undergo donor-derived cell-free DNA testing. Um, and we defined stable allograft function based on the TrueGraph study that uh, I went over and how they defined it. Um, and since these tests do have poor positive predictive values, we still recommend undergoing a biopsy if the levels are elevated, if it's possible. And then for dual transplants, retransplants, and N-block transplants, um, Prospera is the only one that is technically validated in those individuals. So that's kind of why it specifies it um, here in our study. However, there are data on utilizing other tests for those patients. So I don't necessarily feel too strongly about this recommendation, um, but just kind of for your reference. So in summary, donor-derived cell-free DNA has been validated to detect um, acute rejection following renal transplantation with a high negative predictive value. And it's more associated with AMR than ACR and gene expression profiling can be utilized to assess for concerning subclinical acute rejection in lieu of protocol biopsies. And then here are just some supplemental materials and my references, and we'll take any questions anyone has. Great. Thank you so much, both of you, um, for your very helpful talks. Um, I think the questions are probably geared towards both of you. So if you want to take turns answering them. Um, but the first is if you've utilized the same standard two biopsy and Alisher surveillance model for dual transplant recipients, or if you've had to change your models for uh, dual organ recipients. Dan, do you want to go first? <clears throat> 
Yeah, so um, I think I kind of mentioned this a little bit. Um, so we'll usually just look at the donor drive cell free DNA in our uh, utilizing like Prospera and our dual transplant recipients. Um, we do know that it might be like a little bit higher than uh, the baseline for anyone who's receiving, you know, like a single organ. Um, but that's kind of what we usually utilize at the institution that I'm at. And that's just based on uh, that one being the only one that's uh, actually approved for it. At Stanford, we only will use biopsy method if someone is a multi-organ transplant in our heart transplant cohort, um, because we don't feel comfortable with the being able to interpret the cell free DNA results based off of that. Great, thank you. Um, and have either of you anecdotally um, noticed an elevated cell free donor DNA, even with a negative biopsy, and then perhaps investigated what other issues may be going on, like an infection or um, other forms of injury? Yeah, I would say this is really common um, from what I see, at least. I think a lot of times we'll see a high level and a lot of practitioners will kind of start getting really worried and um, unsure. But then when they check the biopsy, the biopsy is negative. Um, so I would say that this is fairly common. I would say almost half the patients I see this happening in. Um, and sometimes, you know, like we do try to rule out other reasons or other um, things that are maybe causing them to be high, but I wouldn't say we always find a reason. I would say sometimes it's kind of uncertain from my experience. I think from our end, when we have elevated levels, we. Uh, tend to just watch them a little bit closer because we found that that elevated level is often uh, quite prescient, uh, that it's maybe like four or five months down the road that patient ends up developing uh, biopsy uh, proven rejection or a drop in EF. So they'll watch like echoes or things um, clo more closely for those patients until the cell-free DNA goes back down yeah. for us. Great. And I know that um, these tests are obviously new overall and very nuanced, as you both described, but have either of you looked at changes in immunosuppression, like um, fluctuating chakra levels, or even changes to an anti-metabolite or steroid dosing, knowing that the last is probably a little bit more nuanced, um, and the impact of that on donor-free, the donor-derived cell-free DNA levels over time? We have not um, look at that, uh, like in terms of making like a protocol based on that. I think that's the goal. I think for most of these uh, programs, if we can figure out a way, but I think it's going to have to come from, you know, multi-center studies and things like the Dior for, uh, for the heart transplant side may be able to glean some of that information, but we'll see. Yeah, I think that's hard too, because there's so many different things that might be going on. So like, depending on if someone has like BK and that's the reason why it's elevated, then you would want to kind of minimize the immunosuppression versus, you know, like using them um, in conjunction with DSA can also be helpful. Like if you have DSA, de novo DSA, and then you also have an elevated cell-free DNA level, then that might be a reason to kind of increase your immunosuppression or making sure not to reduce your myfortic or mycophenolate. Um, and potentially keeping them at like a little bit higher tech goals. So I think it's kind of, you know, like these markers aren't really meant to be utilized individually. I think just using it in combination with um, everything else we kind of have just to kind of give us a little bit more information since, you know, CM creatinine um, not going to be the most specific and helpful marker all the time. Absolutely. Thank you both very much for all of your hard work on these talks and sharing your experiences with these new tests. Um, we do have another break. Um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So perhaps if we could come back around 10, 20, um, 12, 20, 1, 20, depending on your time zone, um, that would be appreciated. And thank you so much to Dr. Pierce and Dr. Henriksen again. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your days um, and we'll see everyone at in about 10 minutes or so.